All right. Well, everyone, um, I hope you've come with a delicious beverage to drink or some kind of a treat or something um, because we have some good news tonight. So welcome everyone to the Western Wisconsin for Nonpartisan Voting Districts. It's a very, very long name, WWNVD, but we are working to have fair maps in Wisconsin. And although we don't have fair maps yet, we have new maps that will start to be used in the November election. So this isn't for the April election, this is for the November election and the next 10 years after that, or nine years after that, I should say. Um, but we don't have fair maps yet, but we have fairer maps. <laughs> So um, we knew we weren't going to have fair maps, but we didn't know how bad the new maps were going to be. And um, this is a happy meeting because of all the bad maps, these are not the worst. <laughs> so um, it's cause for celebration. Some of you remember that in November, the Wisconsin Supreme Court said they wanted at least change approach to the maps, which meant that all of a sudden, the world of possibilities of fair maps got very narrow and it was just like maps that were going to be based on the already gerrymandered maps. But of the maps that are based on the already gerrymandered maps, the one the Wisconsin Supreme Court ch chose was amongst the best. So that is really good news. Um, so raise your glasses. Cheers. <laughs> um, we're really, really pleased for that. It's especially good news for a couple of our assembly districts in Western Wisconsin. It's really good news for people of color, especially black people in Milwaukee. And in general, it's good news for our communities of interest. It's keeping our communities together more than before. So there are lots of things to celebrate. Um, and I just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge i feel like i'm celebrating the maps but i'm also celebrating every single one of you on this call tonight because it is together that we put pressure on to create change and i'm just going to name off a few of the things that have happened in this group um, that you on this call tonight have helped make happen um we sent almost a thousand postcards to legislators we had a lobby day where we um, got trained and talked to our elected officials. We testified in Madison at the hearing about the maps. We had two series of mappy hours. We submitted an amicus brief. We communicated on social media through letters to the editor. We supported the People's Map Commission. And I could go on and on and on. And all of those things have added up to us having fairer maps <laughs> and so this is one step in the right direction and there will be more steps um and i just want to celebrate all of you tonight and really um take a moment to to just be happy about these these maps being better um and i just i'm i'm uh announcing a <laughs> spur of the moment insiders some of you know we had lots of public mappy hours i'm um, suggesting an insiders mappy hour for all of us to celebrate on monday march 7th at 5 p.m at hop and barrel in hudson that's a brewery that hosted us twice for free for mappy hours um and one of the only breweries that hosted us that's actually open on a monday um, so <laughs> Um, I invite all of you to come. I'll be there. Um, I invite you to come and just hang out, have a good time, celebrate together. So mark your calendars and let's let's have a good time together. And I also would like to request your assistance. Um, I, you know, it's kind of a strange message that we're putting out there. These aren't fair maps. We're not super excited, but we're you know, relatively excited. Um, I was thinking it's kind of like going in the ditch and then your neighbor comes by and helps you out of the ditch. <laughs> You're still in the ditch, but you have your neighbor, but that's a little like not strong enough. And then I was like, it's a little bit like 
Ukraine being attached by, by attacked by Russia and then the world coming with the strongest sanctions that have ever been given in the history of the world. And that example is not quite right because we're not being attacked by another nation. So if any of you have an example of an analogy that's in between, it's not the ditch and it's not war, <laughs> let me know. Um, but somewhere in there is, is where we are right now. <laughs> Um, so tonight, um, we're, I'm going to give a quick status update. Carlene's going to give us an update on statewide, um, uh, what's happening on the statewide level. We'll hear from our teams. Glad to have Bill, our new organizing director with us tonight, who will talk to us about grassroots organizing um, and how we can capitalize even more on our collective power as we move forward. And then we'll wrap up with um, a few announcements and fun things that are coming up that we can participate in. So quick status update. This is the last time you're going to see this slide, so enjoy it. Um, <laughs> we've moved from the far left to the right, not in political party terms, but in in uh, on this slide. And we received the decision today um, on the maps. The deadline was March and it's March. We thought it may have been March 1st, but it's in there pretty close. Um, and because these the maps that were chosen were the governor's maps, which create seven minority opportunity districts in Milwaukee, there's probably nothing that's going to happen in the federal court right now because that was the one thing, the Voting Rights Act, that could have happened in the federal court. But our ma the maps that have been chosen seem to um, respect the Voting Rights Act. Um, so there will probably be no action in the federal court. So this is it. These are our maps that we received from the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Um, I put this mostly just, I'll put this in the slides when they come up, but these are links to the maps if you want to go check them out. Um, we're not going to dive into them now, but you'll get this as a follow-up and you can click on them and um, and look at what your district looks like and all the other analytics that are available. And then also here is the Wisconsin Supreme Court decision. So you'll get that in the follow-up as well for those of you who are ambitious enough to read a 150 plus page document, <laughs> but I know some of you are. So. <laughs> um, so to summarize a little bit where we're at, um, we have fair maps these maps that we're going to move forward with in the next 10 years are better than the maps that we've had for the last 10 years. And so that's a step in the right direction. And that's really good news. Um, they're not fair maps, though, because they're based on the maps that we had last time because the Wisconsin Supreme Court decided to use a least change approach, which basically meant that the gerrymander that we've had for the last 10 years is baked into these new maps. Um, but this isn't the end. Um, there's, we will continue to fight. There are a lot of people all across the state that believe in this. And so we'll continue to find ways, whether it's this year or in other years, to um, fix this. And Carlene has some exciting developments on that front that I'll let her announce shortly. <laughs> and I'll pass it over to Bill. Yeah, hey everybody. Um, just a quick update as um, you know, the redistricting process winds down, and um, this team looks forward to its next steps. Uh, we're putting together a leadership team with which includes uh, some of you on this call, like Bob Moline and Allison will be with us. Um, where we're going to get together at the end of the month in Spring Valley, and we're going to go through the the thinking of articulating our next big strategic goal that we can focus our effort on uh, and also think about what are the tactics that are gonna get us closer to that goal and how, how it's gonna play out over time. Uh, maybe thinking about how we can use the election. Um, not exactly sure. I'm just really looking forward to how this group is gonna get together and be creative uh, and really put their brains together and uh, come up with our next path forward. So I just wanna let you know that's in the works. We've got some great people uh, who are um, gonna help us out with that. And if you have an interest in being a part of the team, uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. I'm gonna drop 
in uh, a link. If you want to schedule a meeting with me, you can click on that link and you can find a time that works for you and we can get on Zoom. Or if you just want to give me a call, my phone number is right there. Um, yeah, really looking for people who not only want to help us with the strategy, but are committed to helping us launch it after, after we decide where we're going to go and the people who are looking forward to doing the work over 2022. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Bell. And now, Carlene will give us some statewide updates. Hi, everybody. I just have to say cheers. Thank you for all that you have been doing up until now and uh, and beyond. Um, I am, you know, today is bittersweet. It's um, it's a huge relief because, as Janelle said, it's not as bad as it could be. And I think the governor um, actually articulated it pretty well. Hell yes! <laughs> the maps are um, are not everything that we we would hope for, but it is a huge victory, and we are very grateful that um, you know so many people have stepped up as far back as when Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty wanted the Supreme Court to change all the rules so forever and ever they would be the court of original jurisdiction. You know, we had we had over a thousand people submit comments way back then. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. That was before we actually even got into this. So thank you for all that you've been doing. Um, and um, if you go to the next slide, we will be having a briefing tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock with law forward attorneys as well as other members of the um, Fair Maps Coalition lead team to just take a look at, okay, what does this mean and what are the next steps? Um, we, of course, you know, it didn't come out until the end of the day today, so clearly we're, we weren't going to do this today, but it does give law forward the day tomorrow to look at the implications of this and be able to give us uh, um, a really uh, in-depth analysis of what that looks like. So it, it, it's a webinar. There are 500 seats in the webinar. So um, I, it went out to about 5,000 people today. If you want to be in it, uh, please make sure that you register because it will be limited. Um, and there are three articles that that were in the paper today about this um, right there. So those uh, you can click on as well. Um, and then um, this one of the other things that happened today and probably would have been the news if the Supreme Court's decision hadn't been the news is that uh, four Democratic state legislators Jeff Smith and Deb Andraka, who had submitted the legislation for uh, drawing for the fair maps, or no, not fair maps, not partisan restricting legislation, thank you, which would have arrived at farm, fair maps. Um, they and two of their colleagues, uh, um, Representative Diane Hesselbein from Middleton and Mark Spritzer from the Beloit area, uh, introduced a constitutional amendment today. Now in Wisconsin, a constitutional amendment has to pass two consecutive um, legislative sessions and then it goes to the to the people. Um, but you know that's that's another thing and it is linked there if you'd like to to read the press release about that. Uh, it's not the actual um, amendment that they have proposed, but it, it that actually came out today as well. And then um, this is the project that we are, that we are working on now. And, and Janelle actually asked me earlier today, do we still want to do this Mad About Maps? And it's like, well, yeah, you know, I, th I think, yes, we do want to do Mad About Maps um, because we are not happy with the maps that we have currently, right? We want them to be fairer than they are. And it is one more way to continue to hold legislators accountable. So if you want to play this, this is um, a really short video. Hi, my name is Janine Ramsey. I'm a retired school librarian and I live in Madison. 
I'm mad about the maps because the legislators don't have to listen to us. We have many concerns that many people in Wisconsin care about, such as Medicaid expansion, and the state legislators can just say nothing, ignore us. The maps are so safe for them. Their seats are so safe that they could be a rock and still win. It's really infuriating. So that's less than 40 seconds. Hi, my name is and Janine oops. Ramsey. <laughs> um, this landing page has everything that you need for being able to make a video of your own. I had a, a workshop this afternoon and six people showed up and, you know, they're all going to make, they're all going to make videos. So if you are up for making a video, that would be grand. Um, and you can go to the next one. There are a whole bunch of, of, of uh, topics here that people have named in different sessions that we've had that are important to them and that are being impacted by our current maps and will continue to be impacted. Uh, when you look at the, the breakdown, there is, there, there is in, the, in the assembly, it's more balanced than it has been before, but in the in the state Senate, it's a little less balanced than it has been before. So we're, th there's still going to be an imbalance uh, and a significant imbalance in our state legislature. They are definitely fairer maps, but they're far from fair. And so we are going to continue to need to advocate for the issues that we care about. So. If you decide to make a video, you can say we have fairer maps and legislators need to pay attention to us, however you, you want to adapt that. But we are carrying through with this, uh, this process. And the next one is good. So we're actually on the day after this slide because this is a slide from last night's meeting. Uh, so we're on Thursday now. We're... If you if you determine that you would like to make um, a video, please um, get it in to Jacob as soon as you can. You can do that. Uh, if you go to that website, it's really easy to follow those directions and then uh, get it into him. He'll caption it and send it back to you. And uh, last one for me is... There's lots of things on the agenda as far as really educating folks. If you know, if you are a young person, you know a young person, uh, please share the Loteria um, event with them. It's really fun. It did that last weekend with uh, the for the first time with Citizen Action and uh, Uceli Flores, and it's a great game. Matt is speaking from democracy, also from a democracy campaign on Monday. There is a training, a two-part training from the redistricting data hub that uh, is about prison gerrymandering. So that is one of the things that we have added to the the breadth of the things that we're that we are wanting to address directly. And, and uh, then also, uh, I know Debbie's on this call. She has a uh, an event coming up on Monday the 14th, so not this next Monday, so you don't have to miss that Insider's Mappy Hour. And you can go on the following Monday to uh, learn from Sante Nelson about not just prison gerrymandering, but what the heck's going on. And also the League of Women Voters is starting a once-monthly look at what is uh, what? What are Wisconsin's courts like? And you know, how 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 does this all happen? What is who gets elected to the courts? What how does dark money and recusals fit into the courts? And just you know, this this whole thing with the with the Supreme Court has really highlighted a lot of the issues that impact the courts and the kinds of decisions they make on our behalf. And so thank you. Um, I, I hope that you'll plug into one of those things. That's all I have. Thanks a lot, Carlene. Thank you so much for the update and um, look forward to seeing you tomorrow at five. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and I'm going to sign off is because I have a really big day tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, thanks. And uh, the, you're recording this, right, Janelle? So yep. I can do Bill's presentation because I, I, I'm interested, but I'm tired. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Bye, Carlene. Thank you so much. All right. So from statewide updates to local updates, um, we're going to hear from our team leaders. So we'll start with Anne. Hi. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, Janelle, you sort of mentioned um, some of the things I wanted to say about the legislative team. Last year, we did everything we could think of uh, to contact our legislators, our area ones and across the state to let them know our feelings about uh, the maps and getting rid of the gerrymandered maps. And we were met with essentially silence on all fronts. So the plan changes and I think we go to the ballot box and we vote in legislators who will listen to us. So that's the plan for the legislative team as far as I'm concerned um, from here on out. If they're not gonna listen to us, we don't want them as our legislators. We want a representative democracy. Let's vote for legislators who will listen to what their constituents want. That's it, thanks. Thanks, Anne. And we can vote for a lot of our local representatives on April 5th. I'll more about that later, but um, we have an election coming up so we can start putting that into practice immediately. <laughs> Don? There. Uh, not a lot to report, uh, but that's exciting news today. Uh, so what we've been doing with the uh, uh, WeMap uh, group has been looking back uh, historically, one decade back to the 2002 maps, uh, the last maps, uh, well, the assembly map anyway, that was constructed by a court. And uh, so I just got some background information, uh, maps here that you can stare at. You might look at our current map, congressional map 2011, because it's very, it's gonna be very similar to uh, the governor's map, uh, uh, congressional map. So we map is doing historical research back to 2002. And we're also looking at political geography. Um, and part of this historical work is uh, sort of comparing uh, the transition from 2002 to 2011 uh, to the transition from 2011 to 2022. So a couple of numbers that you might be interested in. Everyone thought that the Act 43 maps 2011 were uh, radical changes and that 66.7% uh, is uh, the core retention rate for that. You can compare that to the governor's map which was 86 point something percent. So obviously uh, that wasn't a least change map. But back in 2002, uh, that map was compared to the 1992 map, uh, assembly map, and it was not up to 86, but 76 core retention is the least change map. Uh, we can look at the maps later. Uh, if you have time, I've got them up. If, if Janelle wants to share the screen or, or she can pull them up. Uh, the one thing that I've been thinking about is, uh, again, this is sort of historical. Uh, what did we learn this past year about the redistricting process? And I've asked my group to give me some ideas. If anybody's got ideas out there that, uh, you know, that you'd like to share, what you learned this past year in our effort, we need to record these things so we don't forget them. Uh, we don't want to repeat uh, bad history. That's it. Don, thanks. Um, yeah, how about if anyone who wants to take a look at our new maps, the governor's maps that were just chosen today can stay on at 815 and we'll, um, we can share screens on that and, and take a look. Um, and I'm sure a lot of that will be included tomorrow at 5 p.m. too um, in the call that the Fair Maps Coalition is organizing, but we can, maybe take a, a look at Western Wisconsin more, more specifically at 815 and um, more information will be coming out about that as well. Uh, so if you can't stay at 815, you will, you will get the information because that's definitely something we want to put out there for folks to understand their new districts. Bob.
Thank you. Hi there. Um, so a team of about, I think about six of us have been getting together to create a presentation we'll share with. Right now, we're targeting the River Falls Chamber of Commerce, but really, we want to expand it well beyond that to, to any small town chamber of commerce in, you know, in the entire western Wisconsin seven county region. And what we're trying to do is, is create a favorable relationship, that is gain allies with what we consider some critical people in every community, and that is small business leaders. We hope to present a clear, compelling message about adverse impact of gerrymandering on small business. And you, know, you, you never know whether you're gonna get uh, uh, a bunch of people to step forward and volunteer on the day you give them a message, but we wanna to begin to, to grow a relationship. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been, what we've been doing is investigating how small business is served by Wisconsin state government. And we don't expect to become experts. You know, we'll be talking with small business people. They are experts in their area. But, you know, just so that we look professional at this as a way to, as a way for them to see us as a, as a useful and, and um, friendly, uh, you know, an agreeable partner in their efforts to keep their business uh, surviving and thriving. So to date, we've had some discussions with some experts in this area. Uh, Russ Corpella in the River Falls Chamber, uh, Sean Fediplace with Main Street Alliance, a progressive um, small business advocate group out of Madison. Janelle has been uh, functioning as team leader on this. And we've got a, you know, there's no absolute hard deadline, but to keep good progress, we've set ourselves internal targets. Uh, you can see that timeline down there where we're doing research uh, in January and February. I feel like we've made good progress on that. Compiling information by the end of February, there was you know, a little bit of a struggle with uh, getting the clear message that we want. So when we, when we met last, we decided these short Zoom meetings might not be the way to go. Monday, the six of us will meet for a three hour in-person meeting and we'll, we'll work through some, any difficulties there and get that presentation. And then we, we hope to review that with the chamber or the chamber president in April and get actual presentations to chambers in April and ensuing months. Thank you, Bob. Janelle, I think that's it for me. Thanks, yeah. Dave? Good evening. Uh, the writing team has been busy and continues to have success getting uh, articles and letters to the editor uh, in area-wide newspapers. Uh, in uh, February, um, uh, we had a nice uh, letter to the editor, or shall we say love letter to the editor uh, by Maureen Ash, uh, How Do I Love Thee, Wisconsin? And that was uh, placed, as we know it, in uh, three papers. It was published uh, three times uh, in the area. And then uh, there was also, later in the month, uh, a really well done uh, LTE as well uh, by Anne Marie McClellan, uh, based on her experiences with the uh, People's Maps Commission as one of the commissioners, uh, and talked about. Um, where we went from uh, working and listening and talking to hundreds, if not thousands of citizens statewide to develop the PMC maps, uh, and then uh, ended up in the courts with uh, our marvelous uh, lease change uh, strategy from the Supreme Court, uh, which led her to end on a, on a note of, of Jerry laundering. And that, uh, actually made uh, six different publications. Uh, five of those were local. One was uh, sort of a middle of the state, almost statewide publication. So that was encouraging as well. And our next push uh, in March will be uh, a get out the vote uh, messaging uh, in advance of the April 5th elections. 
And uh, not on this uh, title, uh, as you can imagine, though, uh, we'll be building uh, some articles and LTEs uh, regarding the new maps. And I think that's about it. Thank you, Dave. Awesome. And back to Bob for social media update. Thank you. Uh, so just a couple of brief updates. In February, we tried an experiment. We've we've tried this experiment before, but you know we want to we want to continue to do so. We did a small paid promotion to gain followers on our Twitter account. Um, it there's you can definitely see the followers you've gained. It's different than other months. It's greater, but it is too costly and inefficient. We may try another experiment in the future. You know where we where we try one hundred dollars worth of promotion we would need it to become much more efficient if we were ever going to use that uh, in, a, in a big way. In March, almost everything we're, we're going to do is leveraging the vote.wi.gov website in you know, uh, urging people to, to ensure they have their voter registration, applying for absentee ballots if they need, and then urging election participation as observers or poll watchers. And finally, uh, just as Dave just mentioned, uh, get out the vote uh, toward the end of March and into April for the April 5th election day. Then in April, we are looking at a couple of dates. One of the things that our video team tries to do is look for appropriate things that are already going on in the news. If there's something that applies to us and it is in the news, you know, it's, it may make it easier for us to ride that wave of news coverage. And so April 15th, Tax Day, April 19th, Patriot's Day, that is, you know, literally the start of the Revolutionary War, Lexington and Concord kind of thing. We may, we haven't decided yet, but we may focus some things on that just so that we can, we can have our message ride any other um, media push that might be going on at that time. And then finally, as, as Carlene mentioned, I, I did on the right side there, you see a, a pitch for the Fair Maps Coalition, hashtag mad about maps initiative. The link that I have is the best one I knew to use, but Carlene gave a better link in her presentation. And I think I've already seen that in the chat. And I suspect you'll see that when Janelle mails out this presentation. Yeah, so if, you'd like to, if you'd like to make a video for the Mad About Maps initiative, use the link Carlene provided tonight. Yeah, fairmapswisconsin.com slash mad. <laughs> yes, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Um, great, well, I'm gonna stop. Well, th so that's the, that's the end of our team updates. So thank you everyone for, for the team updates. I feel really honored to um, be working with so many dedicated people doing such great work. So thank you all everyone for the team updates. And I'm gonna pass it over to Bill now to talk to us about grassroots organizing and, and thinking about how we can use that even more effectively in the coming year. Hey everybody, can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I would have had a cocktail to celebrate with you all, but I think it would have put me to sleep. And since I had to talk tonight, I decided to lay off. Uh, so, uh, but nonetheless, I'm in a celebratory mood like you all are. And I think um, just really inspired by all the work that's been done over the last few years to make this happen. And so I just wanna like get, take my hat off to y'all and I'm just really honored to be here with you and um, getting to know you guys in the last month has been a pleasure too. So. Um, Janelle and I thought that maybe because we're in this kind of period where the redistricting process is wrapped up and uh, we're kind of looking ahead to our next steps, um, thinking it might just be nice for us to zoom out and ask ourselves, like, what is this thing that we call organizing and kind of get back to the basics of like, what does it mean to make change in the world, get together with other people uh, and build a movement? Um, so this might be a refresher for some of you. I think it's a, probably a good good to always refresh ourselves on this stuff. Uh, maybe some of this is new to you too, and that and that's great too. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, 
and maybe you can give me a thumbs up if you see a picture that says back to the basics. Yeah, Bob's giving me, thank you, Bob. Okay. Yeah, so um, before I get into this, I just wanna say a little bit about how I came into organizing. And for me, it starts with my parents and how they raised me and the values that they taught me. Uh, as a kid, I grew up in Eau Claire. Um, I'm a sixth generation native to West Central Wisconsin. My German ancestors came to Dunn County in the 1850s. Um, and my mom was a, uh, a social worker. She worked with people who were struggling with addiction, uh, veterans coming back from war. Um, and she really showed me how the value of empathy and how to respond to people who are struggling uh, by listening. And my dad was very different from my mom. Uh, my dad was an engineer. The world was very rational to him and he had trouble emoting. Uh, but uh, he really taught me the value of like critical thinking uh, and really um, how to think um, in systems and always taught me like, you don't try to fix something until you understand why it's broken. Um, and it was that combination that my parents gave me of my mom uh, showing me how to respond to people who are in pain, my dad showing me how to problem solve, that I think gives me the foundation for what I do now, which is to help people solve problems in their community that causes them pain. Uh, and that's why organizing is so close to my heart. Um, and I love talking about this. So I, I really thank you for letting me have the floor for a little while. Um, <clears throat> I think the main way I could distill organizing down into its simplest form is by this question. And I think every organizer is probably waking up every single morning and asking themselves this question every single day. How do we get the power that we need to make the change that we want? And I use that word power very intentionally because uh, it's a word that makes some of us uncomfortable. Anybody, anybody feel uncomfortable when they think about power? Anybody? Uh, is, or, Janelle, thank you for raising your hand. I, I mean, some of us, I think it evokes images of like corrupt politicians, right? And greedy corporate bosses. Um, but for organizers, our power is in people. Uh, people coming together, not just showing up once for like a protest or a rally, but acting together over time. Um, and power doesn't have to be a harmful thing. Uh, Martin Luther King said it's the, just the ability to achieve purpose. Um, and Walter Ruther, a famous union leader, uh, said that power is the ability of a labor union, like the UAW, to make the most powerful corporation in the world, which at that time was General Motors, to say yes when it absolutely wants to say no. So having that ability to get what we want and by coming together, and power is not a thing. It's, it's a relationship between actors, actors' interests and other actors' resources. And so as organizers, we think about how do we shift that power relationship? Um, and how do we get that power we, we need to make the change we want? And the other reason I think it's really helpful for us to start getting more comfortable with the word power is because it just simply isn't enough for us to have just a well-articulated list of all the policies that we want, right? And why we think they're good. Because there's a gap between our vision, our policy vision for what Wisconsin could be, there's a gap between that and actually being able to make it happen. And it's that in between that I think is the bridge is, is building power. Um, and like I said, organizers answer this question uh, with a simple answer and that our power is in our people. Um, and if we're gonna win, we need a movement. And if, we need, if we're gonna have a movement, we need a lot more leaders. And if we're gonna have leaders, we're gonna have to develop them, support them, and, invite new people in along the way. Um, and so it's about investing in people that become leaders. And really the sad truth to me is that we live in a world where a lot of people have been taught that they're powerless, where that change isn't possible. Um, and so our job as organizers is to help people break out of that cycle of helplessness and victimhood and really help people discover that they're more powerful than they think. Um, and to me, that's really the deep path for us to bring our democracy back to life. It runs under the surface of politics and policy and it's about people learning that they have agency and that they can act together and that they can create change because we have so many problems in the world, but as organizers, we see that the people who are closest to those problems are often the ones who are closest to the solutions. So it's about how do we bring them in uh, and, and 
and find the solutions together. Um, we think about organizing as a form of leadership. Um, would someone be so kind to come off a of mute and read this slide out loud for the group? Don't be shy, someone please. I will, Bill, this is Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, I appreciate it. Leadership, taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose in the face of uncertainty. Thanks, Lisa, while I've got you on, uh, is there anything about that definition that resonates with you? Any like specific word pop out at you and strike you as uh, being accurate? I think the enabling others part jumps out at me the most. Why is that? Um, to address, you know, what, what you just shared that a lot of people feel powerless. And as though I, I know we've talked about this a little bit in some of our other committee meetings, especially the climate environment conversation, which tends to be, you know, very people are very easily overwhelmed with that subject. And I think to the extent that you can break things down and work with others to mm -hmm. tackle a large problem, it's, it's really helpful. Yeah, thanks. I, I agree. The enabling others piece is really huge because I think for a few reasons, one is that we can't solve the problems we're trying to solve alone. Uh, it's just not possible. Um, and then also leadership and organizing isn't about us coming in pretending we have all the right answers and we know exactly what the path forward is. It's about us bringing other people together so we can do that uh, as a team. We can do it creatively and tap into each other's strengths and diversity. And um, so yeah, that, that, uh, thanks for sharing that, Lisa. Um, anybody else wanna share like maybe one word that, that's coming up for them that this, that, this lead, that this definition of leadership, and I know there's a lot of definitions. This is just one definition of leadership. Anything else resonate for someone out there? Yeah, for, for this is Sarah. For me, I thought hey, you know, the um, shared purpose in the face of uncertainty is like what kind of drove me is like, well, if we don't try, nothing yeah. is going to happen. You know, because everything was very uncertain. Sure, it's going to fail. There's nothing, nothing is going to change. So, I mean, for me, that was really a driving force was we've got to go with this shared purpose and see what we can do. Yeah, and it's not just your purpose, Sarah, or my purpose, it's we our are, purpose, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the uncertainty yeah. piece, I think is really- but I, I think even, even like, yeah, but even-, even you're, cutting a lot, you're cutting out a little there, Sarah. Oh, sorry. I That's was okay. just gonna say, the, the, you know, this graphic too, with the one person sort of outlined in black, it's like, well, even if you have an idea that you think is important and you don't say anything and you don't try to rally people, it's, it's failure, right? You, you have to at least try. Yeah. And find out if people share your, your purpose. And the uncertainty piece, I think is huge because we, uh, most of the time when, when uh, we're trying to change the status quo, it's not really clear how we're gonna do it. Or if we try to do it, what the reaction is gonna be and how we're gonna we respond. So just naming that uh, there is uncertainty when we're stepping into a leadership role, I think is really helpful uh, because it's not when we know exactly what to do or when there are no surprises or when there's no new challenges. That's not the domain of leadership. The domain of leadership is when things are unclear and we gotta figure it out as we go. Um, so this is a version of leadership where it's not about being the all-knowing guru who has all the answers. It's about having and developing a gut for uh, kind of jumping off a cliff sometimes, but um, being comfortable with that. But, so but thinking, also, like the, the thing is that there was a shared purpose, even though there was mm -hmm. uncertainty. Yeah. You know what I'm um, saying? It's like you have a shared pur purpose, even though there is that uncertainty. Yeah, and having that shared purpose as almost like a compass to help you move forward. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Bill, so, I, see, I see Pat has his hand raised too. I don't know if you have time for a question. Um, Pat, did you have something to share? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, you know, I like the, uh, the key, those two keywords there, uh, shared purpose, because uh, I feel that by myself alone, I don't really have any power. 
you know, to uh, take responsibility for enabling others. But if I uh, have you know, other people that share the common uh, things in common with me, then I feel that I'm empowered to, uh, I feel more confident, more comfortable in being yeah. able to uh, take responsibility. Yeah. And it's hard to act alone, but when others are there with you, I mean, like, look at, look at all the faces on the screen um, and think about what you all have done together. It's not something that you would do alone, but when you have other people with you, it makes it possible. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. And thanks to Janelle sure. for, uh, cause I can't see everybody right now. So appreciate that. Um, so yeah, thinking about organizing as this form of leadership that enables people to take the resources that they already have, combine them in new and creative ways to get the power they need to make the change that they want. So it's um, identifying leaders, uh, building community around those leaders so that the community itself becomes a source of power so that you can make change happen. Um, and it's a way of, uh, yeah, taking those things that people already have, their skills, their talents, uh, their motivation, their, their relationships and their social networks, uh, combining those together so that they can act independently as a group. Um, and to do that, we focus on a few things as organizers. The first is recognizing that relationships are the foundation for our collective action. Uh, if we're gonna act together, we need to be, get really clear on what we care about and what we wanna change. That's a shared value and a shared interest and tapping into that, um, recognizing that the whole uh, is greater than the sum of its parts. So taking the, the time to identify, Sarah, what you care about and where that overlaps with what I care about so that we can move from being just, not just a community of people who happen to live in the same place, but a constituency of people who are willing to stand together on behalf of uh, the things that they care about because they've taken the time to develop these relationships. Um, and this is why as organizers, we're really focused on like, taking time to learn about each other's values, learn about each other's stories. We want to hear uh, those things because that becomes the glue that holds us together when things get hard, that motivates us to show up for meetings when we get tired, uh, that provides us, uh, you know, that social capital to keep going uh, when um, things are uncertain. Um, so relationships are really, really important and building community and uh, that becoming a source of, of our power. And also, um, it's not just about engaging the people who are already engaged and the people who we know already support us. It's about inviting the people in who might not agree with us on everything, but finding the time so that we can see where that common ground is and where that Venn diagram is, where we overlap. So building community is a huge piece of this. And this goes beyond just delivering a message, right? Uh, and, and um, or getting a donation or soliciting a vote. It's about really going deeper with people so that people can see each other as human beings and stand together when it comes time uh, uh, to act. So once we've built relationships, uh, once we've brought new people in, people who might not support us at first, uh, we need to create a structure where we can hold people together in action, recognizing we can't do this alone. So we got to find a way to collaborate and leadership and organizing is a team project. It's not a solo lone wolf type of thing. So we get really, really want to get clear about how we structure ourselves. And I think what you all have done here with WWNBD is an excellent example of a well-structured team. You've got a core team, you've got uh, satellite teams um, and they're all kind of working together. Um, there's different ways to structure teams. Some are better than others when it comes to organizing. Uh, one way uh, that you can structure a team is you could have just one person be the leader and everybody else, all the arrows are having to come at that person and ask that person what to do, what are the decisions to be made? You know, Has anybody been on a situation like that where you're on a team and there's only one leader and you're just taking orders? Has anybody been on that? Uh, yeah, it can be, it can be good for some things, but maybe not for other things. And what happens to the person in the middle? Uh, often they burn out. And then what happens after they burn out? What happens to the team? It doesn't last very long, right? Um, and then for teams where that maybe was tried, but it didn't really work, maybe some teams go down to this next thing down at the bottom of the right-hand corner. Well, 
it didn't work just to have one person. Let, let's, let's all be leaders. Let's just all run in our own direction, right? Where uh, we're all making our own decisions and you do what you want to do and I'll do what I want to do. Has anybody been on a team like that where it's just everybody just doing their own thing? I have, and it's often felt like, man, we're, we're kind of duplicating a lot of effort here or we're maybe just like we're uh, reinventing the wheel over and over again, not coordinating. Um, so as organizers, we want to do, we want to build teams that look like this. We call this like the snowflake model where it's interconnected leaders who have gotten really clear about their structure and created scaffolding around their team in the form of why they exist as a team, like taking time to clarify their purpose, taking time to clarify how they want to operate as a team, what, how they want to run meetings, all those things. And then what are their roles? Like, okay, you're going to do this. You're going to do that while they're going to do this and being really clear about what everybody's contribution is so that you can distribute leadership. You can share leadership rather than just have one person hold it all. You've got a scaffolding. So now you can start um, bringing new people in who maybe you've never experienced what it's like to be a leader, but, and you're giving them that opportunity to get on a pathway where they see what they're capable of and make real contributions to the team. Once we've built a team, once we've built a structure, uh, we have to think about how we're actually gonna use power and organizers are kind of like chess players, uh, always thinking about strategy. Um, and when you're trying to change the status quo and when you're trying to change something that where power is involved, it's really helpful to ground your strategy in a few simple questions. And organizers ask themselves these questions. The first question is, who are our people? Who are the people and what is their problem? Um, what is something that's directly impacting their daily lives? And then the second question is, what is the change they seek? Which is just another way of asking, what is our goal? And how can it be measured? And how do we know when we've achieved it? And what is the thing that we're working for towards? And then lastly, once you've identified a goal, how do you actually get the power you need to make that change? Um, and so these are questions that people have asked themselves that have been asked in lots of different contexts throughout history. Uh, that first picture up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, does anybody know who that is? What's going on there? Anybody? Uh, someone, someone from Sunday Bible School? That's Moses. That's Moses in uh, talking to the Pharaoh. Um, and I think community organizing goes all the way back to, to those times. Does anybody know, uh, you know, thinking about these questions, who were Moses's people? Someone come off a of mute. Someone knows the story of Exodus, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Weren't they the the Jews, Jews, right? The Jews, yeah. Yeah. What was their, and what was the problem they were experiencing? Allison, are you with me on this? I am with you on this. Yeah, what was the problem they were experiencing? The Jews, the Exodus, and there's there's kinds of questions about what actually happened. But um, they were yeah. enslaved, right? They were enslaved, yeah, and they were leaving. Yeah. And where do they get the power to to, to find their freedom? What they do? Hmm. It seems like they started by petitioning the Pharaoh um, who kept refusing to, to do anything to alleviate their, uh, their concerns. Right. And then, and then when the Pharaoh didn't listen to him, what happened, Doug? So then they escalated until they finally uh, uh, left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they walked out. They, they walked out of Egypt and they used their resources, which was their feet, uh, to get them out of out of bondage uh, in Egypt, and, you, and some might even say also their faith might have been a resource too, because I think God helped them out a few times as they were on the move. Um, right. Then the next the next slide down, Alabama, 1955. Who were those people in Montgomery, Alabama, and what was the problem they were experiencing? Rosa Parks and Jim Crow laws. Yes. So black people in the Jim Crow South, what was that like? If you were if you were black in the Jim Crow South, what were you experiencing? Your dignity was always being challenged. 
You, yeah. you don't deserve the right to sit in the front of the bus. You can't use this restroom. You can't sit here in this restaurant. Yeah. Except yeah that, that word dignity. I think that's really astute, Doug. I, um, yeah, you can't vote. Um, and it's more mm -hmm. than just the, 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 the seat of the bus you're in. It's, it's your value as a human being is being called into question. Um, what was the change that the people in Montgomery sought in 1955? It was very specific, right? It wasn't this vague, uh, we're just fighting for equality. What was the goal that they were seeking in 1955? Was that the the right to vote? The, they were doing the registration drives? Or are you talking about the bus boycott specifically? And the right yeah, the bus, the, the bus boycott. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they were trying to desegregate the bus system in the public transportation system in their city. How'd they get the power? I mean, they were living in a in a in a brutal system that was felt entrenched at times, right? How'd they get the power? They withheld their money. They walked instead of rode. Yeah. That resource they had was their bus fare. It was a nickel to get on the bus individually. That didn't have any power, but collectively withheld. They say that the that the bus boycott cost the bus company four thousand dollars a day. So from a nickel to four thousand dollars a day because of a collective action. Um, so these questions: Who's our people? What's their problem? What's the change we seek? How do we get the power we need? Um, lots of lots of cases where this has been a conversation for people who are struggling and experiencing pain at the hand of a system. So when we, when we do organize, when we do build relationships, structure teams, think about strategies, uh, then we launch campaigns. And we just think of campaigns as just a way of structuring time so that we can focus our resources uh, on a specific goal with specific deadlines um, and achieve what we're trying to accomplish, but do it in a way where we're not just achieving a goal, but we're also building power every step along the way, recruiting people, bringing new leaders in, forming new relationships, expanding our structure. Uh, and we start by laying a foundation. We have a kickoff. We uh, have these peaks. We have tactics that build on top of each other, a smaller tactic, a bigger tactic, an even bigger tactic, so that at the end of our campaign, we're able to achieve something larger that we couldn't have achieved when we started our campaign. Um, so it's a way of structuring time. It's a way about being intentional on how we're using our tactics and using our resources, uh, but building power along the way. Um, one thing I want to say is that this is very much a head, hands, heart approach to leadership. Um, when you're trying to challenge the status quo, uh, you enter this world of uncertainty, um, and it calls for really uh, a style of leadership where you recognize you don't have it all figured out. You don't have all the answers, but you allow yourself to act regardless, knowing that you can learn along the way, uh, because you're constantly engaging uh, your head, your hands, and your heart, and you might not have all the answers, but you're willing to ask the right questions, like, what new skills do I learn, need to learn in order to accomplish this? That's a question to your hands. It's a question of doing. What are the ways that I can use my resources in new ways? That's a question to the head. It's like a question of how. Uh, and then where do I get the courage? Where do I get the hope to think that it's actually possible to change things? That's a question of why, which is a question to the heart and a question we answer in the relationships we build and the stories that we tell. Um, and so thinking about relationship is not having it, a leadership, not as having it all figured out, being willing to ask the right questions and bring your whole person into it. Um, I'm just going to wrap up here and I'm going to say that uh, this isn't just something that comes out of my, this isn't just, you know, something I've thought up. This is something that's a long tradition of people over history, um, combining their resources, getting together to make some amazing things happen. And I just want to lift up a few examples and these are uh, largely rural examples because, uh, um, because we're kind of in a rural part of the state. So the first I want to say, does anybody, is anybody familiar with the Nonpartisan League in North Dakota? Uh, so this is a group of wheat farmers who in 1916 
took the North Dakota state government by storm. They took the governor's seat, they, they took the legislature, and it all started because the nonpartisan league decided to invest in the technology of the, of the day and invest in a fleet of Model Ts and drive from farm to farm to farm and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with wheat farmers who were feeling screwed by the economy. And they won. They not only stormed the state legislature, but they created a state-run grain mill and they created a state-run bank that started financing their, uh, their farms in a different way. Um, and they went from just single conversations to power to get the change that they needed. Another great example is the United Farm Workers, uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, who um, spent years before they ever thought about really holding a strike, meeting, sitting down with farm workers. This is Dolores Huerta sitting in a field with grape harvesters on their break, getting to know them, building relationships, one conversation at a time, which eventually led to something that people said couldn't happen, that you couldn't organize farm workers. Uh, and this is a picture of their march from Delano, California, uh, which is the town where they were striking to the capital of California, Sacramento. And then in rural Mississippi in the 1960s, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, young people organizing sharecroppers, farmers, uh, domestic workers to do something courageous in going down to the courthouse to register to vote in the midst of racial violence, lynchings, um, murder. Um, going door to door and finding people uh, and helping them take that step out of their comfort zone to claim their own humanity. And from these small actions, it led to the Voting Rights Act in 1965, um, building their campaign over time uh, to achieve something that, uh, that to most people, most black people in the Jim Crow South would have seemed impossible. So I really believe in organizing um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop my slides here. Um, and I really thank you for listening to me. Um, in 2019, I quit my job at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I had been a wildlife biologist for 10 years. It was a career that I loved, um, but there were times when uh, I was watching what the Walker administration was doing to my agency. And I had a little voice in my head that was telling me that the conservation problems that I wanted to try to solve, they ran deeper than me just collecting data as a scientist, right? And making scientifically sound decisions, all important things. But I had a little voice in telling me that I needed to go deeper because I felt like I was nibbling around the edges. Um, and organizing has been a source of hope for me. And I'm really, really thrilled to be in this organization, Pierce County Grassroots Organizing, and have the opportunity uh, to do something amazing with you all and to bring this framework that I think uh, we've seen throughout history be successful um, and see what we can do in Pierce County. Um, so thanks for listening to me. I think I've used up all my time uh, and I'll hand it over to Janelle. Thank you so much, Valley. A huge round of applause. Really thank you for that. I think um, We've been using some of those concepts and asking those questions, but I don't think we've been doing it as consistently um, as we can. And I think having a really clear framework um, like that is, is really going to help us um, ask better questions, make better decisions, create better strategy in 2022. So I'm really excited um, to see what's ahead and, and how we can um, use our collective power to create the change we want to see even more effectively than we we have to date. So thank you very much, Bill. Um, so we're going to talk about what's next and Bill's going to be right back up again <laughs> because we are already planning to put what um, Bill has been talking about into practice and um, diving into these conversations with our community, our people that we want to organize. So I'll let, um, whoops, I will let Bill whoop, talk about um, the, the project that we're launching. Got to come off mute here. Um, yeah, uh, so starting in spring and moving into the fall, into the summer and fall, um, 
we've received funding to hire an organizer to help us um, organize a project where we are going all around Pierce County, knocking on people's doors. Uh, people who probably have never heard of Pierce County grassroots organizing, people who may not agree with us on everything. And we're gonna go and any, anybody who answers the door, we're gonna ask them three questions. Uh, we're gonna ask them, uh, what are some problems you have to deal with in your life? Like what keeps you up at night? Uh, and then we're gonna ask them, what do you think is the cause of some of those problems that you have to deal with? Like, who, who do you blame? Uh, and then lastly, we're gonna ask them if you could change anything about your community to make things better for you, the people you love, what would it be? Like if you had a magic wand, how would you make things better? Uh, and ask these open-ended questions and just invite people into, um, into conversations that hopefully build bridges, new bridges in our community. Um, and we're going to be starting this. And if you're curious about it, uh, we're going to have an info session. I don't know if you have the slides up, Janelle, because I can't remember. Oh, what you know what? Are. Thank you for saying that. I so, do, but yeah. I'm looking at them all by myself. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're all, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Um, so Wednesday, March 30th or Thursday, March 31st, they're just a one hour uh, info session on Zoom where we're just going to go through what is this thing we call deep canvassing? It might seem scary to you, but we can train you. Uh, what have we learned by doing it? Um, and how can we apply it here in Pierce County? And why would we do it? Like, what do we actually get out of all these conversations and how do we use them to build power? Uh, in our community. So that's a teaser. If you're interested, uh, feel free to sign up for one of our info sessions. It'd be great to have you. Yeah, go to piercecountygrow.org slash CTC conversations that connect and join us. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'd like to invite you as well to North Shore Fair Maps monthly meeting. It'll be on the 14th, so coming up next week. Um, what the heck is going on? <laughs> and um, guest speaker is Shante Nelson. She's the director of Wisconsin State. Um, all voting is local. And as always, it'll be a very informative and wonderful meeting. So I encourage you to, um, to join that meeting. And don't forget to vote on April 5th. I bet all of you are registered, but just if you're not sure, go to myvote.wisconsin.gov, make sure you're registered. If you want an absentee ballot, ask for it right now. Um, are you gonna vote in person? Are you gonna vote absentee? Make your plan and then tell your friends. Um, so there are a lot of county boards, um, Supervisors that will be up for re-election, school boards, lots of local nonpartisan um, roles that actually have a huge impact on the quality of our lives in our communities. So be sure to uh, look that up. And unfortunately, you can't look up who's on your ballot yet, but you will be able to on March 15th. Although if you want to know who your county board supervisors are, who's running, um, you can go to your county, your county website and it'll be listed there. But uh, starting on March 15th, it'll be listed on myvote.wisconsin.gov. Um, and the League of Women Voters is recruiting election observers. So if that's something that you would like to do, please contact them directly. They're looking for people, even if you can only help for a couple hours, um, that would be really, really helpful. I did that in 2020. They trained me really, really well. Um, and uh, yeah, so that I, I highly recommend doing that if, if you have time on that day. And I'm just gonna go back here real quick because this shouldn't be February, this should be March. So thank you, Debbie. This meeting is March 14th, I'll change the slide. Um, reminder, if you wanna come celebrate the new maps and um, just, talk about whatever's on your mind or look at our maps together, I will probably bring my laptop um, to talk about districts a little bit if people want to, but um, good time to celebrate. Come on Monday at 5 p.m. Hop and Barrel in Hudson. And don't forget, I'll send this in the follow-up too, but tomorrow at 5 p.m. the briefing from the Fair Maps Coalition with Law Forward on what these maps mean to us. Our next meeting is next Thursday, April 7th, 
and our strategy session that Bill mentioned earlier is at the end of March. So by our next meeting, we will be looking at what are we doing in 2022. Um, so that'll be really exciting kickoff opportunity for us to, to look at what we're doing. And that's it. So um, anybody who wants to say, Don, is your offer still open to look at the maps a little bit in Western Wisconsin? Yeah, if I can do the technology okay. <laughs> All right, I, I can always help. I'm happy to yeah. be back up on technology. Um, so anyone who wants to stay and look at the, dis, the maybe the new districts for Senate, Assembly, Congressional, and Western Wisconsin, we can take a look at that. Otherwise, um, we're going to have our little chant. So I'm going to say um, to send us off into our evening um, with our fairer maps and looking ahead at what power we can gain and how we can continue to make progress in Wisconsin. I'm going to say grassroots and you guys are going to say power and we're going to do it three times and then we'll sign off unless you want to look at your maps. All right. Is everyone unmuted and ready to go? All right. Grassroots. Power. Grassroots. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. Good night. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Charlie. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. So Good long. Folks. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Bye.